Good morning. Welcome back to the Mayor's Table. I'm Mayor Tommy Roberts. My guest again this morning is City Manager Rob Mays. Uh, Rob, welcome back. Good to be here. Rob, this morning I want to talk about the recent City Council decision to close Brookside Pool for this summer. And uh, the Council made that decision here in the last couple of weeks after uh, a month or so of giving it some serious consideration and uh, doing some additional research and uh, gathering some additional data upon which to make that decision. Brookside Pool is uh, an iconic uh, institution, facility in the city of Farmington. Mm -hmm. Dates back to 1958, so it's uh, been operating for 57 years. And as one would think, uh, there's wear and tear on a facility of that age, and particularly a swimming pool. Mm -hmm. um, let's set the background a little bit and uh, talk about some of the problems that we were experience, experiencing in the continuing operation of Brookside Pool. Yeah. So you mentioned you know wear and tear that that's obvious and generally that kind of falls into the category of maintenance things that can be repaired and kept up along the way. This really goes way beyond that. Probably the lifespan of that pool was probably supposed to be thirty to forty years. This community got f sixty years out of it through great maintenance, great repair, but just bit by bit the very infrastructure itself has just deteriorated down to to its failed. It's not a matter of external cosmetics. It's a matter of literally the very, the very core and foundation of it, the piping, uh, the concrete designs, the, the, the drains, things that, are, that can't be replaced have, have begun to fail. Um, but the real issue that finally closed Brookside Pool really boils down to our inability to operate it safely and within the required health standards of the New Mexico Environment Department. For about as long as I can remember in my tenure here, going back to Jeff Bowman's days as our Parks and Rec Director, year after year, we've dealt with this issue of our whether we would even get a permit to, to open it on an annual basis from the state because we have not been meeting the filtration requirements for exchanging the water. Uh, we've been operating under a, a grandfather clause for a number of years, and then the last couple of years we haven't even been able to meet the standard of the grandfather clause. So as some of our uh, folks will remember last year, we, we tried desperate measures of o only opening it every other day with hopes that it could, the water could exchange on the off day and we could keep ahead of it. But it just became apparent last year, even with those kind of extreme measures, that we, we couldn't keep up with it. Yeah. So I think uh, from my perspective as an elected official, staff has done a very good job in trying to keep that pool open for the benefit of citizens who are interested in using it. Uh, and there is a, a demand uh, for an open water facility in a pool uh, setting. And uh, But let's talk a little bit about the cost uh, to, to place the pool back into compliance yeah. with state guidelines. So while there would still even be no absolute guarantees that we could have even still met it, our estimates, we had a professional third party um, pool engineering firm come in and really assess the pool. They ran cameras and did things they could even try to get and see the things that you can't see. And we estimate at least $1 million would be the cost to give it, to give it a chance of the major, major renovations needed to have extended its life in any, any real way. And that just becomes a not a good cost benefit analysis. We'd still have a 60 year old pool spent a million dollars of it when in reality probably replacing the pool brand new as is in a large flat pool is probably somewhere between one and a half to two million dollars. So the idea of spending a million dollars to, to to try to eke out a few more years of a six year old facility. You know there were other problems that the developed mayor you'll, you'll recall like last year we documented we lost over 1.1 million dollar 1.1 million gallons of water it was leaked into into the grounds somewhere, so we just we just know that the system was just completely failing. So clearly, it didn't seem smart to to invest a million dollars where there'd still be question marks when that's nearly the cost of replacement. Based upon all of that information, the council made a reasonable decision, in my opinion, uh, to go ahead and close the pool. Uh, but when we lose an opportunity of that kind, another opportunity presents itself generally, and that's the case in this situation. Uh, Two principal um, uh, moves, I think, have been made, and I want to talk about each one of those. The first of them is to uh, address the closure of Brookside Pool and the lost opportunity in a more temporary way, mm -hmm. 
and that involves opening Lake Farmington to recreational use this summer. Describe that program. Yeah. So kind of a short-term solution and a long-term. It's possible that that short-term solution won't be temporary. It might be permanent swimming, but, but the council did authorize a, a change in our ordinance to allow for swimming opportunities this very summer to try to, to replace the what's not we're not going to have this summer at Brookside Pool. That will be offered free of charge. We'll be roping off an area and developing a, you know, a nice little swimming beach out there to give some outdoor uh, recreation opportunities. You know, and the kind of exciting thing about that is it's also an incremental step in the right direction towards the, the kind of the big vision of Farmington Lake that we've talked about on this program before. And it's a good step in that direction. It'll actually be able to be accomplished from a cost standpoint. We'll spend less developing and operating uh, a swimming opportunity this summer at, at the lake than we actually spent operating Brickside Pool. So it's a cost neutral on the short run. And then the longer range opportunity is a, a bit more grand in mm -hmm. scale. And it's, uh, it's exciting uh, as we think about it that the uh, council has just recently given staff direction uh, to pursue in greater detail this grander uh, option. And that is a water park um, facility, mm -hmm. something that most people in Farmington would have seen in other uh, larger communities. But the city council has been uh, presented information about these kinds of facilities in si communities the size of Farmington and even smaller. Yeah. And one of the things that it was impressed upon me is the fact that these kinds of facilities can be operated in the black. Um, now, yeah. granted, the uh, capital costs of building them likely will never be recovered. Right. But uh, you look at these things in the context of economic development, uh, particularly tourism, bringing people from the outside into our communities, spend their dollars. And these kinds of uh, facilities have helped to improve economies in places that have um, built them. Talk more yeah. specifically about what uh, can be done and what the, the uh, vision is. Well, earlier you really hit the, the nail with a hammer when you pointed out that outdoor swimming is an institution that's been going on here for, you know, for you were a child swimming at Brookside Pool, to put that in perspective. And, and so we feel like we've got to have something. It would be a real missing piece of, a, I think, an established need in our community. The question is, what would we build? Do we replace it with a, just a flat pool like we've had, like we've had? When all the, the emerging national trends in aquatics really are starting to point to, to, to people really aren't that interested in the flat pools anymore. They're more interested in these water parks with lazy rivers and slides and rock coming walls and basically a playground in the water, lazy river for the teenagers, float out areas for adults. And these have been extremely successful in communities. As you pointed out, we've looked at in our case studies and in our initial analysis, you know, for example, one community with only 10,000 population has over 60,000 people using that pool. By contrast, Brookside Pool is down to running between 13 and 15,000 people a year. So even in our own community, we've seen that national trend. There's been less and less interest in Brookside Pool over the years. Clearly time for something new. So certainly my opinion, and I th is, you know, obviously economics are always a factor here in cost, but it wouldn't make much sense to just replace exactly what we have when we've seen the interest in that waning over, over the years. Why not go big with something that, that as you said, would, f would, would fill two, two needs for us? Not only would it be a great quality of life project for our citizens, but something that would be an attraction as an economic development point would be, would be great to continue to bring people in and maintain our position as a regional commercial hub give people a reason to come in on a Friday and stay in a hotel and eat in our restaurants and go to the, the, to the pool on Saturday and make a weekend out of it. Before we close this segment, uh, let's talk about the uh, process that uh, staff has been directed by council to pursue. Well, the, the idea of this as an economic development um, advantage is, is, is such a real issue that the CVB has agreed to put up the money to sponsor what we would call a community-based feasibility study. So what we will be launching with hand-in-hand -in -hand with the CVB will be a process of, of bringing in a consultant, show us options, show us pricing, show us business models, study our market, and to really do a very, very um, extensive analysis of the feasibility of building a pool. It would also include a, a, a major emphasis on community input 
into what the features would be and what kind of a pool would we build. And then ultimately to help uh, citizens and obviously the elected body ultimately make a decision on what kind of a priority this would be for our future. I think we want to uh, mention before we close that the CVB is an independent organization. Independent of the city of Farmington, it generates its revenues through lodgers tax. Mm -hmm. So that's the source of the fund for the feasibility study. Mm -hmm. And then I think our viewers would be uh, asking the question about uh, what's the source of funding for the uh, capital improvements, the uh, the cost of building such a facility. And we've looked at options there, but uh, it appears that the most feasible would be to refinance outstanding debt, extend that debt for a longer period of time, uh, but generate a lower interest rate so that our debt service remains the same as it has been during the life of the bonds to, to date. That's right. And that's a very a uh, reasonable, viable way to fi finance projects of this kind without raising taxes. That's right. So that's, uh, that's the funding mechanism. Well, Rob, thank you uh, for being with us to discuss this project. I think this is one that a lot of people in Farmington will be very interested in watching as it develops. Uh, we hope that uh, you've uh, gotten some information this morning that's helpful to you who are viewing this segment of the Mayor's Table. Thanks for being with us, and we'll see you next Monday.